start this the conference this conference will now be recorded sorry about that <laughs> no problem good afternoon and welcome to this session of the APS state grantee meeting we normally enjoy meeting with states face to face because that gives us all an opportunity to network with each other and share information However, we are happy that hosting this virtually has enabled us to open up this year's sessions to as many representatives as states wanted to have, so that's a good thing. Today's session is the second of four webinars that will be hosted this week and next, and our subject today is communication. My name is Leslie McGee, and I work with WRMA as a staff member of the APS TARC, and we are hosting the session for you today. Next slide, please. The National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System, or NAMERS, and the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, the APS TARC, are a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by the WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services official policy. Before we start, I have a few housekeeping details. This webinar is being recorded. That said, I would like to remind everyone that we are using GoToMeeting for this session in order to provide an interactive forum for participants. Please ensure that your microphones are muted unless you are speaking so that there is no background noise. Also, we are asking that only the panelists use their webcams. You will have the ability to ask questions during the presentation, or you may type your questions into the chat box. Neither I or Andy Capehart also from the APS TARC, who is assisting with this, presenting this session, will read the question to the panelists for their response. Next slide, please. Today's discussion will be centered around the grant projects and activities where communications was a particularly critical aspect. We have asked three states to serve as panelists today and share their experiences with communications as it relates specifically to their grant activities. Next slide, please. Marlene Kaufman is the grant coordinator for the Arkansas Department of Human Services. Marlene will discuss how stakeholder communications impacted Arkansas's grant project activities. Next slide, please. Kate Nance is the grant coordinator for the Utah Department of Human Services. She will provide insight into the work Utah is doing with multilingual outreach, specifically to the Hispanic community in their work to address financial exploitation. And finally, next slide, please. Michael Roberts, the APS Director of Performance and Policy Development for the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, will discuss the role that internal organizational communications have played in the success of Texas's grant activities. Next slide, please. At this time, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to take a few moments to tell us a little bit about yourselves and briefly, briefly describe your state grant projects. Marlene, would you please go first? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, again, my name is Marlene Kaufman. I'm a social worker um, with the Arkansas Department of Human Services, Adult Protective Services, um, as their program coordinator or grant coordinator uh, for this grant. Um, lifelong Arkansas resident, and I hope that you guys are enjoying weather wherever you are. Um, a little brief overview of our, of our grant. Um, we had several different objectives uh, to, uh, to reach for. Uh, one of them was a new software system to increase the ability of our investigators to um, be able to document and report. A um, couple of other things that we develop, we're, we're working on developing and working on is multidisciplinary teams. Um, and a mentorship program and an education program. Uh, part of that multidisciplinary team build, build uh, was to build a stakeholder registry. Uh, using the stakeholder registry, we then you we then were to were reaching out to our stakeholders across the state to um, to get buy-in and participation in the multidisciplinary teams. I guess that's my overview. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> Next, uh, could you go, Kate, please? Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Kate Nance. I am the grant coordinator for the state of Utah, um, and we are currently in the second year of our grant. So our project is um, we have the goal of reducing financial exploitation among Utah's vulnerable adults. Um, so obviously, this is a big project and we're trying to hit it from a lot of different angles. Um, but today, I really want to speak about um, the outreach that we're doing to the community, particularly the Spanish speaking community, um, and also a little bit about the outreach we are doing to law enforcement and prosecutors as well. So that's me. Thank you, Kate. Michael, could you please briefly describe your project and introduce yourself as well? Certainly. Uh, my name is Michael Roberts. I'm the Director of Policy and Performance for Adult Protective Services in Texas. Uh, we're a state-run APS program and we have about 750 total staff um, and about 500 of them are frontline caseworkers. The grant project that we have is, uh, the goal of that is to improve financial investigation outcomes. And so we are partnering with um, a couple of the uh, district, district attorney's offices in uh, a couple of our large metro areas. And there's also a senior justice assessment center in the Houston area that we're partnering with. And we have an existing relationship with the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. They do uh, medical consultations for us. And so they are uh, subcontracting with a forensic accounting firm to provide the expertise that's needed for this project so that we can uh, improve the exploitation cases that we do. And by working with district attorneys and other law enforcement uh, personnel, we can hopefully improve the, uh, the prosecution and even perhaps restitution through civil cases for the victims. Thank you, sorry, I was on mute. Um, can we have the next slide, please, Andy? So I'm going to have each of our panelists talk a little bit about the specific communications needs that they faced with these projects. And Kate, I would ask you to go first with this question. I am happy to do that. Um, so we wanted to reach out to our community in a variety of different ways to really make sure we're reaching everybody. So our plan was to do uh, presentations through senior centers, conferences, things like that. Um, also have materials delivered directly to our homebound individuals through Meals on Wheels and case managers. And finally, to create materials that um, you know our partner agencies could distribute as well as post on social media or their website just to really have a lot of outreach. Um, and like I mentioned, our focus was really targeting our Spanish speaking um, community here and making sure that we were reaching out to them. So um, our goal wasn't just to um, translate the materials that we had into Spanish. So we wanted to have something that really you know, was appropriate for the community. So we met with some community partners um, and did our own research and realized that there are some scams that specifically are a problem in Spanish speaking communities that the rest of us might not encounter, specifically um, notario fraud and immigration fraud um, is, is a big problem. Um, so we went ahead and the, the general materials we created, we updated them to include these scams um, as well to distribute to those communities. Um, and before we went ahead and had them translated, we sent them out for cultural competence review to our community partners, which um, was really helpful. And they gave us feedback that I never would have thought of. Um, for instance, always make a note if a hotline or an agency resource that you're including make a note if they have Spanish speaking operators available. Um, and also one that I thought was interesting, if you know there's an option to press one for Spanish, write that on the brochure itself. Um, people don't like to listen to a, a long message in a language they don't know, you know, to see if it tells them to press a certain button for Spanish at the end. Um, and finally, they also encouraged us to put whether the agency would request a social security number. Um, 
you know, a lot of people are, are hesitant to call agencies that might request this information. And, you know, given how underreported financial exploitation is, it was really important to us to make sure that we're not doing anything that, that could discourage reporting. So we made those changes that they told us, and then we went ahead and had it um, translated into Spanish um, and, you know, kind of changed up our images to make it a little more approachable. Um, and we also did this with, we have a, a we have areas with significant uh, Native American populations, and we did this with them as well. Um, there are some resources that are specific to financial exploitation in Native American communities. Um, so we included those. Um, and then we just, as we were distributing them, we had, uh, you know, to our AAAs and things like that, we had some in Spanish, some tribal, and some just regular that they could hand out. Um, and then briefly, I just want to talk about, we've also created um, training for our law enforcement and our prosecutors in the state, um, which has been really great as well. And we've gotten a really good response to that. So that in a nutshell is the communications need we have. Thank you very much. Marlene, you want to go next with this question? Okay. Um, so we looked at ours, we're, our stakeholder registry was built um, to kind of um, get an idea of who the potential players would be with multidisciplinary teams to get feedback from the community and also be a resource directory for our investigators and other partner agencies. So um, we, um, we started looking at how we were going to build the multidisciplinary teams, where they were going to go. Um, initially, we thought we were going to do seven regions. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, 12 regions. Arkansas is, may not be as large as Texas, but we definitely are very diverse. And not only diverse in our population, but we're diverse in our um, geography. So there are places that you can't get to from here because I like to tell people, you can't get there from here. Um, so it makes it difficult to get around sometimes. And uh, one of the things that we try to be cognizant of is if we have a professional who's agreed to be a part of a multidisciplinary team, we don't want them to have to drive three hours for a one hour meeting. That's not a good use of their time. So we started looking at that, all that. So we divided it into 12 regions um, and then, um, one of the fun things that happened uh, was we uh, we needed email addresses so that we could start surveying our participants, our potential participants. And so um, phone calls were made to almost everyone in that stakeholder registry, um, and which was really, um, really a great thing um, because um, those participants, um, we talked to them and they um, they gave us good feedback even on that phone call and um, they were um, understood where we were coming from and, and um, matter of fact they told that I've been told when we sent out the survey I was a little disappointed um, about the results that we got back and I was told that uh, when we looked at it, uh, we had a 13% return rate on our on our survey, and I was told that that is beyond excellent. So I attribute that to the fact that we made those personal phone calls um, to stakeholders, and we've gotten a really good idea of what, what we've got going on in the state. Um, also, because of COVID, it kind of changed up things. So instead of doing 12 regional um, multidisciplinary teams, we were able to back that up to four. Um, and because we are doing Zoom type meetings, it makes it easier for everyone to participate. Um, and that is getting some really good feedback from our folks. So those are our needs. Okay, thank you very much. Michael, would you like to share? Yes, so um, we have uh, communication needs that I, I'd like to break down into internal and external. Um, so we have, of course, our programmatic staff, our caseworkers, our supervisors, our, our managers 
that, uh, that need to be aware of what's going on with the project. Uh, we have a training department that's outside of, of APS. And one of the big pieces of the project is uh, the forensic accountants are going to review our training curriculum and um, recommend changes. So there'll be a lot of communication between um, the, those accountants and our curriculum developers. And, um, and then, you know, the, there will be back and forth of, of trying to make sure that everybody's kind of on the same page with, with what's being recommended. And then the curriculum developers and the trainers work together to, to make sure that the, the curriculum is delivered appropriately. Um, of course, we have communication with our finance and, and budgeting folks to make sure that we're, uh, that we're doing everything correctly from a financial and, and contracting end. And um, and we we keep our attorneys involved just to make sure that everything is uh, is 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 legal and that we're we're following all the steps there. Uh, we also have internal uh, excuse me external communication um, among our our partners. Uh, of course, APS, UT Health, Ide Bailey, the forensic accountants, the Houston Senior Adjustment Se Senior Justice Assessment Center, the Harris County and Tarrant County District Attorneys. Um, Harris County is, is Houston, Tarrant County is the western side of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. And so um, another piece of the, the grant project that we're doing is we're developing checklists for staff to use in their forensic accounting, in their financial investigations that um, the forensic accountants and law enforcement have had input into. So, so the uh, the, pol the police officers and prosecutors are telling us, here's what we need from you when you want us to pursue a financial exploitation case criminally. And so there will be uh, communication as that's being developed and then communication disseminating that to our staff and ensuring understanding, perhaps working it into our policy and most likely working it into our, our training. And then uh, the final piece of our, our grant is actually having forensic accountants delivering um, case-specific assessments for financial exploitation allegations. And so we're fortunate in that we have an existing web-based platform that we use for medical assessments. And so um, once, we, once we incorporate forensic accountants into that platform, the, the communication will be to our staff of um, just like you access the geriatricians that we that we have consult on our cases, you'll consult forensic accountants using the same uh, web-based platform, processes, policies, and, and things like that. Okay, does anyone have questions for our panelists before we go to the next question? I did want to ask Marlene one thing about something she said. You talked about changing from 13 teams to four and using Zoom meetings. And I was curious if you still had everyone participating, who would have been participating had you stayed with the 13 teams? Um, by, um, well, we, we're going to do 12. Um, we've had some director changes uh, since this started. Um, so we've had we're now on our third director. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, we, we, we had some fun stuff going on. Um, second, third director, okay. Um, and so the, the thought was um, she was going to participate in all 12 of those meetings or he was going to participate in all 12 of those meetings. And again, we were trying to be cognizant of time and travel. Um, that is a big expense and that is a big you know, well, it takes away a lot of time. So um, when we were able to break down the, tw break, move it from 12 to four via Zoom, obviously that meant um, better particip participation. Our um, area supervisors, we have four area supervisors and um, we were, they were not real thrilled with participating in 12 and, mm -hmm or even six, uh, or, well, actually it would probably be three each or something to that effect, uh, different meetings, and, and because that took a lot of their time, um, even on Zoom. Um, and so it just kind of made it a little easier uh, to manage. 
that way they they only had to devote one hour um, to those meetings a month. But you still have the level of participation you think we you would have gotten. Yes, um, our, our, the folks that are um, participating in the community, the stakeholder partners, are actually really excited about it. And uh, when we go to the next question, I'll discuss that. So, okay. Well, since we have that segue, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? And Marlene, you can just keep going. Please describe go any new or different approaches you used to engage your grant partners that were more effective than previous approaches that were used to engage them. Um, well, we're kind of new at this um, in a way. Um, so this is a, a, a giant leap for us, I guess, or baby steps. I'm not sure which one to describe it. Sometimes it feels like it's a, a, a giant leap and sometimes it's baby steps. So um, there really hasn't been a whole lot of formal communication between um, our department and um, stakeholders and partners other than when we needed when we had interactions with them in regards to a case so um, having a formal let's talk what do you bring to the table what do we bring to the table how can we work together um, kind of communications has been really exciting for our for people in our state for for uh, partner or stakeholder participants in our state um, because they've been excited and this is an opportunity for us to learn from them and them to learn from us. Um, so um, they were really, when, when they started getting those phone calls just to get an email address, they were really excited to hear hear from us and um, excited to, to hear that we wanted their input. Um, so that was kind of a change, I guess, in the way that we have done our outreach is we want to hear from you, which was a big, big deal. Nice. Michael, would you like to go next on this question, please? Sure. Um, so we, we, uh, we tend to do a lot of projects in our APS program. Uh, but one of the things that I'm I'm really excited that we we've done is that we have um, we've brought together all of our partners and we we held a, a, a big kickoff meeting where we explained the project um, and we got to uh, we got to see faces it was it was by technology just like this and uh, and so that was really nice to to put faces with names, especially for some of these uh, these partners who we in our APS state office have not necessarily worked with. They worked with some of our um, our field leadership, uh, but but again, not not the people in our state office. And uh, part of the uh, the funding on our grant is uh, someone at UT Health to coordinate a lot of the project on their end. Uh, you know the the grant had to go to an APS organization, um, but we have we've had such a strong relationship with the UT Health Science Center in Houston for a couple of decades or more by now that um, we've been really comfortable with um, them taking the lead on a lot of things and us um, and us checking in with them. And so uh, again, communication is important there. Um, by, by having developed that, that relationship. And so their, their research associate uh, pulls together a lot of the meetings and keeps track of, of certain things. Um, you know, on, on the financial end, APS has to, has to keep that um, be, because we're, uh, you know, we're the grantee and we're, we're spending both state and federal funds on this. So, uh, you know, there's some things that we can't hand over, but, uh, We've been very fortunate to have a lead partner in UT Health that is really, um, really helping us shoulder a lot of the burden. Thank you. And Kate, um, can you respond to this question, please? Sure. Yeah. So, um, regarding our outreach to Spanish speaking communities, one of the big things we wanted to make sure we were doing is not just reach out to them through the traditional our traditional aging partners like our triple A's and the Alzheimer's Association and AARP. Um, 
we know that those only reach a limited amount of seniors anyway, but um, they tend to have less engagement with the Spanish speaking communities. So we really wanted to go to these people where they were. Um, and we, we kind of thought a little bit outside the box here. We actually, one of our best places we started with was the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, um, which isn't necessarily a natural fit with aging, but they know everybody in that community and they were so helpful um, to give us connections to people who were really trusted um, organizations and trusted leaders in the community. Um, for example, one of the most successful presentations we've had, um, of course, we're all online at this point, um, was with an organization that does business development um, within the Hispanic community. So um, we did like a Facebook Live interview. And um, for that one event, we reached 200 people, which um, I don't know how many people you're getting at your online trainings, but that was really huge for us. And um, we were just, it, it was important that we found, you know, who those trusted people were within the community. Um, and then, you know, the people followed. Um, the people in the community know them, trust them, and, and showed up to the event. Um, so that was fabulous. Um, and then as far as um, how we have worked with our law enforcement and prosecutors. So we formed a committee of police officers, district attorneys to help draft the training. Um, we wanted this to be something that everybody had input in, and, you know, was just very inclusive of everyone's point of view. Um, and how we are doing that a little bit differently is rather than having, you know, a big one-time training that people can come to, we are going to go out to the agencies themselves. So um, a couple of years back, our APS um, did a training with law enforcement and prosecutors. They, we did one in the southern part of the state and one in the northern part of the state. And I think they got between 50 and 75 people at each of them. So um, with our first training that we did, we did it with the Salt Lake County District Attorney's Office. We Um, and it can be really easy. Yes. Oh, did I go away? That's okay. Hey, Kate, we lost you for just a second there. I wasn't sure oh, if it was okay. me or if it was everybody, but for just about 20 yeah. seconds, we lost you. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so I was just saying with our law enforcement, um, we want to get out to everybody. Um, we know that financial exploitation cases can be really tricky especially for a patrol officer who might not know, you know, what a power of attorney is, uh, you know, how a guardianship works. So we just wanted to really give them the tools that they will need, um, you know, to respond to those and not simply list it as a civil matter or a family matter and then, and then leave. So one other just little nugget, um, I know we've all been adjusting to virtual trainings and the quirks they have, like my audio cutting out and all that thing. Um, but one thing I did want to mention is we were doing some community presentations where someone who was hard of hearing was going to attend. Um, and I didn't know this, but not all of these platforms have closed captioning options. Um, I believe Microsoft Teams does and Google Meet does already built in. And then of course, um, if your organization can afford it, you can you can pay to have closed captions made. Um, but a lot of organizations just don't have those funds. Um, so one thing I did find out um, through working with our partners in that area was that there are several free services um, where people can get closed captioning services like three or four free hours a month. So um, if that's ever comes up in your um, in your area, it was just great to be able to find a resource to include people um, who might have otherwise not been included. And that's, that's, what, that's my answer. That, that's extremely helpful. Thank you for sharing that. And we may be asking you to give us that resource list so that we can share it with everyone else, because that would be um, a lot of help for a lot of people, I think. Thank you. OK. Um, I think we are ready for our last question, unless anyone has any questions on this topic. 
this is Andy, and I'm running the uh, technology today, but I do have a question for Kate after listening to her talk um, about the outreach to the um, the Latinx community. Did you have uh, an, did you have to hire someone who was who spoke Spanish? Did you use an interpreter? Um, how did you go about translating or interpreting um, both like live presentations and the printed presentations that you have? Oh, excellent question. And I'm sorry I didn't answer that. Um, so within our agency, we do have several Spanish speakers, um, but they are people who speak it as a second language. So it was very important to us that we have, you know, someone who is a native Spanish speaker um, be able to record these presentations. So with the presentation I did live on Facebook, that one was actually done in English. Um, I guess a lot of their population speaks English and they, they wanted to do it that way. Um, and they were okay with me doing it. So I did. But as far as future ones, um, we have reached out to our partners in Salt Lake County um, and they have an educator, uh, you know, a Spanish speaking educator who has graciously agreed. Um, I gave her all my materials and she is recording a presentation that we plan on distributing to other organizations that um, don't want to do, um, you know, something in English. And we did kind of want to stay away from an interpreter because you kind of don't have that personal connection. And, and also we just wanted it to feel like it's somebody from their own community, you know, not like an outsider coming in and you, Sure. how it should be done but i'm sure a lot of you know i would love to hear like states like texas and arizona um how you guys do it because i'm sure you just have a much larger percentage and anyway thanks thank you anyone else have a question for the three panelists on this topic Just as a reminder to everyone, you can either type your uh, questions in the chat box or you can actually unmute yourself since we're using um, GoToMeeting and not a GoToWebinar platform. You can actually unmute yourself and ask live questions if you like over audio. Okay. We'll see you then. We'll go to topic three. Next slide, please. And I'm going to ask Michael to go first with this question or this topic. What is the plan for your ongoing involvement in door communications once the grant period ends? Sure. Um, yeah, we definitely want to continue the relationships that we're building in in this grant project. Um, the, the the key hurdle is the is the funding. And so what we are looking at now is is ways that we can advocate in our uh not our session our legislative session that begins this january but two years from now uh, how we can build a case to increase our purchase client services funding which is where we've been paying for our uh, forensic assessments on the medical side from and you know we'll, we'll continue working with with the partners on ongoing uh, updates to curriculum and uh, we will work with our staff to increase awareness on use of our forensic assessment center network technology that's kind of that's kind of an ongoing thing where as staff uh, come on and the staff roll off uh, sometimes uh, usage will will wane a little bit and we need to uh, do a little bit of re-education with our staff. Uh, we have existing training for staff when they when they're hired and uh, related to the to the network. However, uh, sometimes the new staff don't always uh, you know re remember that they're they're kind of hit with with uh, drinking from a fire hose when they start with us with you know two weeks of training and some field work and then another week of training. So um, it's understandable that sometimes they forget about some of the the more nuanced or more rarely used uh, resources that they have at their disposal. So, um, so, so what's really helpful is some of the work we're doing to track the outcomes, and so that will help us communicate with uh, with legislative offices when it comes time to put our request in to uh, fund this effort after the grant ends. Okay, thank you. Marlene, would you care to 
share about your plans for ongoing involvement, excuse me, or communications after the grant? Sure. Um, the multidisciplinary team seems to be, um, well, in the education component, uh, we have a, um, a full-time educator who will be a part, who is a permanent position um, even after the grant is finished. We are in our third year. Um, part of what she will be doing is educating the public, doing public outreach, and part of that will be um, working with the multidisciplinary teams. And um, the APS director will be, um, will continue to spearhead those multidisciplinary teams. So that's who's going to be the driving force behind keeping them up and um, making sure that we have people at the table. And of course, from what I'm gathering from what, from our participants, they're going to be a really huge driving force. Um, uh, you know, ideally we wouldn't, we wouldn't want APS to be the, um, the, the mother of this, um, we are, but we don't want us to be the only, um, only one who, who kind of brings it along. We want our participants to, to have buy-in and feel like that they are part of it and, um, and, and help and have them help us steer it. So um, hopefully we'll have some, we're looking at some participants that are going to be a, a good driving force for us also. That's absolutely going to be key, excuse me, mm -hmm. <clears throat> because as, as the participants will only participate as long as they see value in it. And if they feel like they don't have a vested interest in it, um, they it will not sustain itself. So I think you guys are headed in the right direction with, in that regard. Kate, what are your plans in Utah for ongoing communications once the grant period ends? Yeah, so um, one of the main things we would like to do is train volunteers um, to educate, you know, people in their communities about financial exploitation and scams. So some potential partners, we're not quite to that step yet um, due to COVID and all the slowdown it's created, but, um, you know, we would like to partner with our AARP volunteers, um, AmeriCorps Senior, and perhaps SHIP, um, you know, just training to get the word out. Um, another thing that's a little bit hard is, as I'm sure you guys all know, new scams are coming up all the time, you know, and we wanna make sure that we're staying on top of, of you know, what's current and what's relevant. So we are hoping to develop a partnership with our Attorney General's office. Um, so in Utah, we had a case of a legislator's wife last year um, getting scammed out of about $150,000. Um, and this is all public record in the news. Um, with one of those social security scams where they say your social security number has been, you know, associated with a crime. And anyway, um, she was so brave and talked to everybody about her experience. And her husband was instrumental in getting a bill passed, um, you know, to reduce this and and um, give banks more power to uh, with like delay transactions and things like that. And one part of the bill was that the attorney general's office is now mandated to have information on their website about, you know, scams and frauds. So I would love to get some sort of partnership with them. Um, you know, our intake workers here, all the latest and greatest with scams. And I would love to have a partnership where we could help them keep their, um, their website up to date. Um, another thing we would really like to do is post our training materials online. So, so that they'll be available in the future. Um, not just printed materials, but presentations as well. Um, so on that note, we have developed a couple of, or we're in the process of develop, developing a couple of presentations. You know, one of them is just traditional, somebody talking um, with a script, but we're also looking at things that are a little more engaging, um, like animations with, you know, music and fun things like that, um, that may be more palatable, you know, to people in a nursing home or an assisted living facility, um, things like that. Um, we're also very lucky because our, um, one of, one of our police agencies has created a, a brand new database here that uploads any training you wanna have there. So we do um, wanna get our police training up for that so that any agency we're not able to visit in person, um, that people will still have access to it. 
that way. Cool. Okay, well, those are the three topics that we asked our panelists to address. Does anyone have any questions about any of the information that you heard this afternoon? Because if not, I do. That <laughs> will go next. Uh, Michael, you, you talked about your relationship with the university, and I'm curious that you said it was a long-standing relationship and that you leveraged that for this grant. My, my question is, what was the nature of the relationship before you started the grant and what, what things were you working on together with them and was it under a contract basis then? Because it's obviously a valuable relationship for this project and I'm wondering if other states would be able to reach out to similar entities in their states and start that if they don't have a funding stream for that right now. So I'm just kind of curious how the whole partnership was used before and if maybe there's a way to start something without funding for other states if they wanted to do that. Sure. Um, so the, the the relationship with UT Health Science Center started about 20 years ago and it, it started with uh, with a local relationship between uh, the university and our our management there in, the, in our Houston district, and so they uh, they had doctors there at the medical school who would go out on capacity assessments with our staff. Of course, we would we would pay for the the capacity assessments, but they were they were one time purchases, and uh, and so uh, the the doctor would would meet the caseworker at a at a house and and the doctor would would you know run through the the standard uh, capacity assessment that that they would do and they'd give a, a, de a determination so um, we we then expanded that and we added a telemedicine aspect to it and so now staff from any of our 254 counties can have access to the the doctors at the UT Health Science Center and can uh, can do a capacity assessment by FaceTime on their iPhones or through another technology with their tablet PCs and um, the the doctors will also do records reviews and will testify in court and so um, there's a there's a nurse that coordinates that and so so we now uh, we now have a statewide contract with them, and so this this uh, exploitation issue has been something that um, they've been interested in, and of course we've been interested in it as well. And so uh, then we had the idea of what if instead of just using this uh, this web-based portal where case caseworkers can upload information, uh, doctors can ask questions, they can um, provide uh, a written determination through that uh, portal. What if we used it for other sorts of services and um, namely the, the forensic accounting services? And so uh, even though we're still working through a medical school, um, they are uh, subcontracting to add that expertise and we're leveraging existing technology that we only have to do some minor updates to in order to uh, accommodate forensic accountants. Wow, okay. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Michael, this is Andy. I have one follow-up question too. Did, were you able to select the forensic accounting firm that you wanted or did you have to go through a bid process with your state? Um, was there anything to that? Um, I would have to check back on that for you. Sure. I don't remember exactly how we did that. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Any other questions for any of the panelists, Michael, Kate, or Marlene, while we still have them? I um, have quite a few notes, actually, and I consider myself to be pretty well informed about stakeholder um, engagement and communications activities. But um, I loved, for example, Kate, your statement that you did your research and it was more than just translating the materials that you had. 
into another language. It was more about um, meeting them where they were culturally and finding out what was important to the community and making sure the materials themselves didn't just speak in their language, but actually spoke to their needs. And I thought that was pretty powerful. And um, I appreciated you sharing that. And um, I'm also, I, I just asked Michael a follow up question about the thing of his that interests me the most of what was going on in Texas. And of course, Marlene, I think MDTs are extremely powerful. And I am hopeful that um, you all are able to get the level of, of engagement from your participants where they will ensure that it continues on and NAPS can take a step back and let them run that process. That will be extremely, extremely powerful for your state if that if you are able to make that happen. So um, anyone, last call for questions. Andy, my next slide was questions, but I kind of skipped that one. So could you go to the last slide, please? I want to thank uh, Marlene, Kate, and Michael very much for their participation today. Like I said, I took quite a few notes myself and thought the information was extremely helpful and enlightening. Um, if you all have any questions or would like to um, get in touch with Michael, Marlene, or Kate, um, just reach out to the APS TARC and we can make sure to make that connection for you. I wanna thank everybody for participating today and give you back 15 minutes of your afternoon. I will say have a great day and thank you for participating. Thanks everyone, have a good weekend.